Okay, the chapter number one in the third unit, Sunrise on the Hills, written by H. W. Longfellow, the American poet. Let's know something about the poet. H. W. Longfellow, 1807 and 1882, was an influential American poet, translator, and professor at Harvard University during his lifetime. Longfellow was, during his lifetime, Longfellow was considered the best of all American poets. He was considered to be the best among all the American poets, and his work was widely translated and published in various other languages. The poem Sunrise on the Hills presents the experience of the poet as he watches the sunrise amidst the hills. So this poem gives us an experience that the uh, poet had while the sun rises. He watches the sun rises sitting um, on, a, on a valley, sitting on a mountain, and what experience does we will have? So while going through the poem, we all we also feel the same as we are sitting in front of on a mountain range, or sitting on a valley nearby a brook and uh, witnessing the sun rising. Okay, anyway, let's continue. Okay. Travel is in fact an eye opener. There is no doubt it gives us so many information, right? It opens up a new refreshing snapshots before us and often helps us change our philosophy of life. So as a uh, travels journey teach us, teach us so many things that sometimes we will have to change our, uh, our attitude towards life it changes our philosophy of life now read the poem sunrise on the hills sunrise on the hills part one i stood upon the hills when the heavens wide arch was glorious with the sun's returning march i the poet stood upon the hills he, he was standing there on the hills when the heavens wide arch the heavens wide arch what is the arch? What is the wide arch of the heaven? It is the sky, right? The point means the sky was glorious with the sun's returning march. So the sun, the sun comes every day and goes back. At night it goes, right? Again it comes back in the morning. So that's what the point says, returning march. Understood? So while the sun returns the next morning, so it is the daybreak, right? So in the morning, while the sun comes out, uh, the, you can see the sky glorious with its beautiful light. So here you can see the sun's returning march is an example for personification because marching, march means to walk, right? And it is the capacity, it is the quality of living things and the poet here attribute the quality of living things to sun which is a non-living thing. So it's an example for personification. And first of all, let me tell you, this poem has been uh, uh, divided into three parts. And the first part is abundant with um, visual images and the second part is uh, filled with auditory images. And in the third part it is very short and the poet conveys a beautiful message. Okay, so here in this poem, the poet uh, talks about the beauty of the daybreak. While you observe it standing on a valley, standing on a mountain, what are the things that uh, feast your eyes? Right, that, what are the things that gives music to your ears? Those are the things that the poet discusses here. So, as he says, I stood up on the hills when the heavens wide arch was glorious with the sun's returning march. So, as the sun, uh, it is the time of daybreak and the sun emerges and you can see the sky, the wide arch of the sky out of the heaven is glorious with its color. And woods were brightened. So, as while the rays of the sun follow the wood it is brightened and soft gales went forth to went forth to kiss the sun clad veils soft gales actually gales is said to be uh, a kind of wind which, which is very powerful wind gales means very powerful wind and here the poet says soft gales means soft wind actually so it can be an example for oxymoron hope you had learned what is oxymoron right you have learned what oxymoron is because uh, in the poem that the leveler you have learned victor victim right oxymoron is two words having opposite meaning brought together as in victor victim here soft we all know what does it mean the word the word soft what is the meaning of the word soft and gales means powerful wind how can a powerful wind be soft it's not possible so two words having opposite meaning brought together so it's an example for oxymoron Okay, when I tell all these things, you can mark it there in your textbook so that it will be easier for you while you, when you read it next time. And you'll be asked to prepare appreciation and these things that you not now will be of immense 
use for you okay okay then a soft gales went forth to kiss the sun clad sun clad veils so the wind the gales went forth advanced went forward to kiss to kiss the sun clad veils veils means valleys clad means cloth sun clad veils means the valleys that put on the cloth of sun as the sun rises it shower it uh, shed lights on the valleys and the whole valley is has been covered with the light of the sun and now the wind the soft wind goes to kiss the sun clad veils the clouds were far beneath me as he was standing on the hill the clouds were far beneath him and the bathed in light so they they also the clouds also were filled with light bathed in light they gathered midway round the would at height the cloud they gathered round they gathered around the midway round the wooded height wooded height means the higher hills filled with woods thick woods so the hills that has been covered with woods and the hill have been uh, surrounded by the hills have been surrounded by the clouds and they gathered midway not to top not in the bottom midway they covered the uh, hills uh, wooded heights wooded heights means the hills covered with wood they they gathered midway around the wooded heights and in their fading glory shone like host in a battle overthrown and in their fading glory so as the sun rises do you think the cloud will remain forever the fog the mist that has been that prevailed throughout the night but once the sun started to emerge the sunlight and the warm the warm rays of the sun will demolish right will destroy the cloud so and in their fading glory so as the sun comes up they they started to fade their glory the cloud started to lose their glory and they shone they shine shone they started to give light like horse in a battle overthrown just like a people just just like an army uh, defeated when an army defeated in a in a war what happens they will withdraw right they will hold up and they they will uh, come back just they will just run back so as the sun started to rise the sun rays started to fall over over the uh, clouds and the clouds started to move away from the space just like an army overthrown in a battle so they they started to run away so here uh, you can see an image where the, you can see a sun rises and the valleys a lot of trees understood so that's how you can see the fog surrounded the midway the hills right i just wanted to show you how beautiful it would be at the time of sunrise to see or from standing on a mountain standing on a hill how beautiful it will look like so from this image it is visible somebody is visible and the poet is very uh, very powerful and his his craftsmanship in writing this poem is very evident that each and everything has been a clearly depicted pictured right we get a, a clear image of the scene of the sight and beautiful sounds and everything from the poem okay as many a pinnacle with shifting glance through the gray mist thrust up in its shattered lands as many a pinnacle pinnacle means the top the uh, the zenith of the the topmost point of the hills with shifting glances it moves its glance while uh, the cloud moves sometimes it is covered sometimes it is uh, seen with its shifting glance through the gray mist through the gray mist the mist that uh, that have covered the mist that has covered the uh, hills we can see through the gray mist thrust up its shattered lands they thrust up uh, they penetrate their hills upside through the mist so as the mist covered halfway we can see the end the uh, pointed end of the trees outside as you saw in the image you can see the trees here once it is covered with once it is covered with uh, four here you can see only the uh, topmost part of the trees just like lands the pointed part of the lands and the all other part will be covered will be some submerged by the uh, cloud right that's what the point mean so uh, the trees looks like lances lance it's a, a kind of weapon a uh, long one having a point that uh, you have seen right uh, especially uh, in war people uh, 
or riding the horses will use it, right? Spear, spear, you know, right? Spear, that's what we call lance, okay. So, uh, through the gray mist, thrust up its shattered lance, so through the mist, it, it is gray in color, and they thrust up, they uh, penetrate up its shattered lance, lance means its pointed edge, and rocking on the cliff was left. The, rock, the rocky part on the cliff was left, and it, it is just there, untouched by the sun. The dark pine blasted bare and cleft, and the dark pine, they were dark pine trees, they blasted bare and cleft, and they were demolished. Blasted means demolished. Actually, to, there was darkness, but once the sun uh, started to rise, the darkness has been removed and cleft, that it has been broken, that there have been a crack. Now the darkness is not that powerful and the, the sunlight has made a uh, gap in the darkness. The dark pine blasted bare and cleft. The wheel of cloud was lifted slowly, the wheel of the cloud, uh, the curtain of the cloud was lifted and below glowed the rich valley. So as the as the wheel of the cloud was lifted, when the cloud was removed, we can see the glow, the rich valley. And then now we can see the rich valley, the beautiful valley, and the rivers flow. We can see the trees, the, uh, the valleys, and the waterfalls, everything. Right. And the rivers, rivers flow was darkened by the forest shade. The rivers, we can see the rivers, and but it has been darkened by the forest shade. So as the a shadow of the forest fall on the river, it has been darkened. Or glistened in the white cascade, sometimes it is glittering, right? In the white cascade, cascade means small waterfalls. So as the uh, sun shines, as the sunshine fall, uh, falls over the cascade, it is glittering, where upward, in the mellow blush of day, the noisy bittern wheeled his spiral way. And in th at that place, the noisy bittern, it's a kind of bird, bittern is a kind of bird, you can see the image there, right, uh, the bittern made her spiral way upward, the bird making a spiral flying, flying here and there she makes her way spiral upward, bird upward, in the mellow blush of day, mellow blush means light blush color, um, some kind of red, pink color of the uh, sky, in that pink color of the sky, the bittern, the noisy bittern, the bittern making noise made her spiral way she started to fly here and there in a spiral way okay so here the poet explains a lot of uh, visual images the, the way that it, it flies the way uh, the um, clouds retreats right the cloud retreat uh, from the war and uh, the uh, sight of the waterfall and the sight of the uh, trees covered with fog and so many visual images are there in the first part right and the And you can see he, the poet. The poet has used uh, figures of speech like uh, personification. I already told you personification, and he has used simile also. You, you must have seen here, uh, like hosts in bat battle overthrown. Here, the poet uses simile because you know what is simile, right? When something is compared to some other thing, using the word like, it is called simile. Here, uh, the retreating of the cloud and in their fading glory shone like host in the batting field overthrown. So here the retreating of the uh, cloud has been compared to an army defeated, right? So when an army is defeated, they run for their life together, right? So when, when some, if someone looks at them from distance, they can see a, a dark color moving somewhere, right? When they are running together to some particular direction in a group, it looks like that, right? And the same way, when the cloud moves from from one part to the other, it is just like an army defeated, retreating from its battlefield, and it is an, a beautiful example for simile, right? Okay. And the, the noisy bittern wheeled her spiral way. Then she will she flies, uh, making her way just like a spiral pattern. Okay. And here you have got some glossary, some word meaning, bittern, a small speckled bird of the heron family, we had seen the image there, found in North America. Bittern is found in North America. Cascade means a small waterfall, 
cliff, a high area of rock with a very steep side, often on a coast. Cliff means uh, the uh, rock that goes um, upward, especially in a coastal area. That the one that you had learned in the chapter, his first flight, it is a cliff, right? And lance, a very long, thin pointed weapon used in the past by soldiers on horses. Uh, just like spear, I told you, a long one having a pointed edge. Here, the sharp pointed top of hills, rocks. Here, the point by lands, the point means the sharp pointed edge, pointed top of hills that uh, that thrustingly comes up outside from the cloud. Right, only the top part was seen, and all the other part has been covered by the fog. So it, it looks like uh, some lands, lances. Okay, wooded means covered with. Trees, wooded height, you have seen the uh, expression there. Wooded height means the, the height, the high part of the land that has been covered with wood. Okay, let's go to the second part. Sunrise on the hill, part two. I heard the distant waters dash. So I, in the beginning itself, I told you the second part is full, um, mostly found auditory images. In the first part, we found a lot of uh, visual images and here you will find a lot of auditory image, right? Hope you understand what is visual image and what is auditory image. Visual image means the image that, that we can see in our mind. While we read that lane, we can see the image in our mind, right? We, while reading the cascade, we can see the image in our mind, right? The bittern making her spiral way. We can see the image in our mind, the bird flying in that way, right? So it is full of visual images, the first stanza, so we can see that image in our mind. And here it is full of auditory image, auditory image means image which uh, appeals our sense of hearing. It talks about some voices that we can feel the sound, right? So I heard the, I heard the distant water dash. I heard the sound of waterfalls, water dash means water moves, moves with fast. I saw the current whirl and flash. I saw the current whirl, whirl means going round, right? Whirl and flash, give, uh, move forward. Then for all this, you can hear sound also, right? Waterfall and the movement of the water also give us, uh, there will be sound. And richly by the Blue Lake's silver beach. And by the, by the Blue Lake's silver beach. Why is it called silver? Because there is sand which is silver in color and richly by the Blue Lake's silver beach the woods were bending with a silent reach and there were so many woods so many trees and they were trying to touch the floor bending their backs right the woods were bending with a silent reach they were bending and trying to reach the floor then over the veil with gentle swell then over the va valley veil mean valley over the valley with gentle swell slowly uh, so it started to swell feel something gentle swell the music of the village bell so the village bell, the music from distant village bell started to fill the valley. The music of the village bell, so it's also an auditory image, right? Came sweetly into the echo giving hill. So that music of the bell, village bell, came to the sweetly, came sweetly to the echo giving hill. So in the hill, uh, at some time, uh, at some particular places, we can find it echoing, right? Echo point, you must have gone, right? Visited. So when you produce some kind of voice, the, Right, the, the voice will echo, the place will produce the echo of the sound and just like that the voice of the bell, the music of the village bell came to the valley to give, to produce its echo, came sweetly to the echo giving hills, yes. And the wild horn whose voice the woodland feels was ringing to the merry shout that faint and far the glen sent out, were answering to the sudden short thin smoke through thick-leaved branches from the dingle brook. And the wild horn, it's also a kind of bird, right? It's said to be a kind of owl or a kind of bill horn or something like that, an American bird. And the wild horn, whose voice the woodland fills, and its voice fills the whole land, whole woodland was ringing to the merry shout. And the word, the bird was ringing as a response to the merry shout she heard. She heard some kind of shouting from somewhere and her voice was a response to that sound. That faint and far the glen sent out. The merry shout, it is faint and far. The sound was faint, it was not that clear and it was from far away and the glen sent out. Glen means the valley. The valley sent out this voice and 
this bird was ringing in response to the sound that sent by the glen were answering to the sudden shot thin smoke through thick leaved branches from the dingle brook and the sound that the glen sent out was answering to the sudden shot thin smoke it was because there was there was smoke of fog right thin smoke through the thick leaved branches the uh, branches of trees and it, it has been thick leaved it is thick leaved and from the dingle brook dingle means the uh, valley covered with lots of trees so from the uh, valley covered with a lot of trees and through the um, le thick leaved branches some kind of fog some kind of smoke comes outside and in response answering to the uh, presence of the uh, smoke the glen sends some kind of shout some kind of merry shout and in response to this sound the wild horn makes noise understood so uh, each sound produced in the valley at the time of sunrise has been mentioned here if thou art worn and hard beset with sorrows that thou wouldst forget if thou wouldst read a lesson that will keep thy heart from fainting and thy soul from sleep go to the woods and hills no tears dim the sweet look that nature wears so this is the third part of the poem the first and second we already discussed in the first part we have seen so many uh, visual images and the beauty has been depicted uh, elaborately and in the second part mostly we have listened to the voices that the valley produces and here in the third part it is comparatively short part and here the poet tries to give us an advice a piece of advice if thou art worn if you are tired art means are if you thou means you though means you art means are if you are worn inspired and hard beset and uh, you have been affected some something badly something has affected you very badly and if you are not good if you are not uh, healthy mentally happy right with sorrows that thou would forget and you have some sorrows that you wanted to forget that you would forget if thou would read a lesson and you want to read a lesson uh, you would read a lesson that will keep thy heart from thy means your that will keep your heart from fainting and thy soul from sleep so something has happened to you you are not uh, that happy you are gloomy something has befallen on, on you something came uh, some uh, um, bad omen some something that is not favorable happened to you then you wanted to forget you would forget and if you would read a lesson if you would read a lesson you would forget all these sorrows you would forget all the things that happened to you if you would read a lesson that will keep your heart from fainting from failing from stop working right and thy soul from sleep so all there is a medicine there is a something a treatment there for all these pressures for all the problems that you face you have to do just one thing go to the woods go to the nature go to the trees and hills go to the woods and hills and observe it watch it the nature has the power of healing the nature can cure you whatever ailment you have whatever sickness you have the nature has the power to heal your problems not as dim the sweet look that nature wears so whatever problem you have whatever sorrow you have to you are going through all this sorrow will be will be removed from your heart just by having a look at the beautiful nature so visit the nature go to the woods go to the hills and no no tears dim the sweet look no tears can cover no tears can conceal the beautiful look that the nature wears right so the through this last part this it is a very important part of the poem too right the nature has the healing power it has the power to rejuvenate our mind it has the power to motivate us it has the power to inspire us right and even it treats our ailments too so in the first from the first two stanzas we do it is not clear that what is the mood of the poet right he uh, merely explains the sights and the sounds that he witnessed there in the morning and here from in the third stanza we find that the poet was not that happy he was there was there, there was something which uh, worried his thought uh, which uh, bothered him and now he says that by having a look at the beauty of the nature we can forget all our worries that's all the poem 
Hope you understood and enjoyed. Read the poem uh, thoroughly, listening to the answer and uh, listening to the meaning. If you find it difficult, uh, if you find it a bit hard to understand, watch the video again and it will be easy for you. Okay, we will have some more discussion regarding this chapter. Go, uh, this or the glossary, you can find it there behind your text. Right, review of the poem Sunrise on Hill. We will have a small review. The poem Sunrise on the Hill is a didactic poem by the famous American romantic H.W. Longfellow. It's a didactic poem. You already know what is didactic poem. Didactic poem means a poem that teaches us something, some valuable thing, right? It says if a person is fed up with hectic life and cannot concentrate on one's routine work, uh, fed up with the life here in this world, and spending some time with nature will soothe, solve all his worries. As I said in the last stanza, also whatever may be your issues can be solved by the nature. It is a subjective poem in which the speaker shares his own feelings and perception. He, he shares just his feelings. The poem makes use of several poetic devices. The poem abounds in images. So many images you can find. The prominent one is the use of military image to highlight the paradox in the poem. So the best best image is the prominent one is the use of military image, the uh, withdrawal, the retreat of the cloud, right? The retreat of the cloud has been compared to the to a military soldiers retreating from a war field, battlefield, right? You remember that when the sun comes out, the cloud moves away just like a retreating army. So the uh, soldier, the image of the soldier is um, the prominent one is the use of military image to highlight the paradox in the poem. And actually it is a paradox too. Here we say, towards the end of the poem, we say we can find peace, happiness, everything in nature. And at the same time, the uh, poet compares it to a battlefield, right? In nature, there is a peace, solace, calmness. And at the same time, he compares the nature to a battlefield where from where an, an army with retreats and uh, another army, uh, the sun is an army defeating the others. So it's, it is compared to a battlefield. So it is a paradox, right? Okay, the first stanza uh, abounds in visual imagery, whereas the second has numerous auditory images. End rhyme and alliteration used in the poem enhance its lyrical quality. So you can see the beautifully uh, rhyming words have been used, rhyme scheme you can see, and you can, uh, alliteration have been used. So many alliterations have been used there in the poem. It employs poetic devices like oxymoron. I told you, oh, oh, soft gales. Soft is not appropriately uh, explained gales. Gales means powerful wind, and soft is something soft, right? So gentle and soft. So it is an example for oxymoron. The speaker resorted to nature when he had tough time and exhorts us to do the same when we confront with difficulties in life. He resorted, he seeks shelter in nature when he confront, when he faced something difficulty, some, something uh, um, disturbing his mind. The paradox lies in the fact that the nature forces are active and powerful, but at the same time submissive to mightier forces. Right, nature has power and at the same time when mightier forces come, it is submissive. That, that's what we saw, right? Um, at night, it, it was uh, um, ruled by the cloud and mist. The whole valley has been ruled by the mist. But in the morning, one, once the sun came out, they retreated. So that's it. Um, the paradox lies in the fact that the nature forces are actual and powerful, but at the same time, submissive to mightier force. When powerful forces come, they are submissive. So when sunlight came, the uh, cloud withdrew. Okay. Title of the poem, uh, how the title suits to the poem. The poet watches sunrise from the top of a hill. He observes the changes that occur in the nature as the sun rises. So he watches, he observes what changes take place. The poem presents a number of visual and auditory images to speak about the coming of day, putting an end to the dark and silent night. Right. Uh, it, the, po uh, the poem gives so many visual and auditory images and it talks about the coming of the day putting an end to the dark and silent night. A common childhood observation, imagination is voraciously painted in this poem. So uh, just like a small child, he, the poet observes the sights and he has been uh, uh, elaborately explained, depicted, pictured the uh, sight through his words. The speaker sees nature as a source of uh, inspiration, a cure, and an ultimate solution. He says there is a cure, solution, and inspiration in nature. The speaker realizes that grace, 
grace of sunrise conquers the glory of all other natural powers. Right, the grace of sunrise is something more powerful than any other thing that uh, conquers the glory of all other natural powers. Sun is a symbol removes darkness and taints. Sun is just a symbol that removes darkness and uh, it brings out, uh, it unveils the beauty of things. Mood and tone of the poem. What is the mood and tone of the poem? There is no obvious mention about his mood in the first two stanzas. So when, when we read the first two stanzas, we do not get any clue about his mood. And, but from the last stanza, it's clear that the speaker is not very comfortable. So from the last stanza, it's understandable that the poet is not very comfortable. He might be fed up with disturbing thoughts that he cannot concentrate on his activities. So from the last stanza, it, it can understand, uh, it can be understood that uh, there is something that disturbs his mind. Toward the end of the poem, the speaker advises us to, the, to do the same when we are fed up with life. Uh, he asked us to do the same. Uh, if you are fed up with life, just visit uh, some uh, places having and then the, uh, and observe the beauty of the nature and get yourself cured. Nature has the power to rejuvenate. The speaker appears to be didactic in tone. So in the last stanza, we can understand he is trying to advise us. Right. So it is a didactic poem. Poetic devices. A lot of poetic devices are the use of symbols like sun, forest, bittern, screech. Right. Sun makes all sides visible and it removes all sadness and darkness. So it's a symbol, right? Symbol highlights hidden beauty and treasures. It, it brings out the beauty of things. Military image, auditory image, visual, so many, so many images. A military is a part of visual image, right? Auditory image is the kinesthetic image means uh, something that depicts the movement, the movement, uh, the flowing of the water, the falling of the uh, cascade, the movement of the bird. Right, the rising of the smoke. So the movement, when the poet talks about the movements, it's said to be the kinesthetic image. So three types of image you have learned from this poem. Visual image, you, you already know that. Something that appeals out the um, sense of sight, right? That is visual image. Uh, auditory image, something that appeals our uh, sense of hearing. And kinesthetic image means something that moves, right? The, something that talk about the movements of things. Okay, heaven's wide art is a metaphor for, right? Heaven's wide arch is a metaphor for horizon. So here the poet compares the sky to an arch, right? The clouds, sun's returning march is military image. The clouds shown like host in a battle overthrown is simile, I told you, right? Uh, like the poet used the word like, so it's an example for simile. Wheel of cloud, wheel of cloud is also an example for what? Wheel of cloud is an example for metaphor because the cloud has been compared to wheel without using the word like or as, so it's an example for metaphor. Didactic elements in the poem, what are the didactic elements? A pensive speaker exposes nature to ease his personal worries and realizes that all his troubles are universal. His reflection teaches us that, right, so the poet explores nature to uh, ease his pains, ease his personal worries. And he realizes, he understands that all his troubles are universal. It's not just his trouble. His troubles can happen to anyone. And his reflections teach us that observing nature will help one forget his tension and change one's mood. So it is the first lesson that he tries, tries to teach us. So by observing the nature, we can forget our tension and change our mood. Moreover, there are several interesting and rejuvenating things around nature. Not just that there are so many things which can rejuvenate, which can uh, instill so many forces, uh, powers in you, diversity of resources. Even a common sight gives one a lot of information, just as common sight. If you just have a look at the nature, a, a, a sight that you usually watch, and still that sight is capable of giving you so many information. The cunch to conquer and outshine is natural instinct, right? Uh, the thirst to win. the thirst to overpower, the thirst, the quench to conquer and outshine is natural instinct that that was what we saw while the sun came, uh, the, it started to conquer the clouds, right? Everybody has unique appeal but their glory subsides when stronger wounds appear. So everybody has his own power, right? And But they, they lose their glory, their glory subsides, subsides fades when stronger ones come, right? Nature has the power to rejuvenate. Troubles are natural, internal nature, not external nature can suit one. 
right? Nature has the power to rejuvenate, but it is not the external nature, but the internal nature that can suit one. So there is no use if you have a beautiful sight around you, if you can't enjoy it, you should have the heart to understand, the heart to enjoy the nature. So the beauty inside is more relevant than the beauty outside, right? So if you have in the heart to enjoy whatever there is outside, you can't find happiness. At the same time, if you have a heart inside, which having an aesthetic sense, having an aesthetic taste, then only you can find happiness in nature. Okay, that's all from this chapter. Hope you understood. Uh, as I told you, go through the lines of the poem again and again and understand, try to understand each and every line, every word of the poem. Okay, and uh, try yourself to create, uh, to attempt an appreciation of the poem. Okay, anyway, we wind up it here. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.